Ambassador Pfeiffer, greetings and great to see you on First Western. Glad to be here. This week we remembered the victory over Nazism. In your opinion, does the world face today uh, a little bit similar situation as it was during the Second World War? Well, I don't think we quite have the situation that you had in, in World War II, where Nazi Germany at one point had conquered uh, a large part of Europe. Uh, but certainly we're seeing with the unprovoked war that Russia has launched on Ukraine, uh, which began really in 2014, but of course with the massive invasion in February of 2022, uh, you know, this has been, I think, probably, the, it, this is the most security threat, serious security threat the largest and deadliest war that Europe has seen since 1945. Also, Russia, despite heavy losses, uh, decided to organize a military parade, but they used only one battle tank. What is your impression about it? Uh, well, I suggest that that uh, probably reflects the fact that the Russian army has lost a lot of main battle tanks, either destroyed or captured in Ukraine. And certainly the uh, parade that we saw on May 9 in Moscow um, was much smaller than uh, previous parades. And I think that reflects some of the stress that the Russian military is under, given uh, the uh, course of the war against Ukraine. Also, I would like to cover an uh, attack on Kremlin. There are lots of versions and theories on this. What is your pers personal opinion about this incident and uh, how could this incident influence domestic situation in Russia? Yeah, uh, first of all, I, I don't think I have a lot of information to make a firm judgment, but I don't exclude that this could have been a false flag operation conducted by the Russians themselves. It's hard for me to understand how these two drones could penetrate the various circles of air defense around Moscow centered on protecting the Kremlin and then not be destroyed until they were right above the Kremlin. And then the, um, the theory offered by the Russians that these were designed to assassinate President Putin, uh, that's hard to understand because President Putin rarely visits the Kremlin and uh, he almost never sleeps there. And my guess is that that was well known to the Ukrainian military. So I'm pretty suspicious of this, that this could well have been a false flag operation. Now, to what effect, I'm not sure. Uh, from some of the anecdotal reporting I've seen, it seems to have increased nervousness on the part of Russians in Moscow. Also, Kremlin promised to respond to this incident, but we didn't see any unusual activity. Russia just continue as usual to terrorize us with missile strikes and drone attacks. Don't you think that a lack of response to the Kremlin attack uh, indicates that Russia cannot escalate more? Well, I believe that there are certain limitations on how far Russia can go. The fact, for example, that they're using S-300 missiles, which are designed to uh, destroy aircraft, that they're using those in a surface-to-surface -surface role, suggests that they may, in fact, be running low on precision-guided weapons. Uh, so I think there are some indications that the Russians are under some strain. Uh, they have been using a lot of missiles, a lot of weapons over the past 15 months. And uh, it may be that in some areas they're beginning to run uh, low on weapons. In my mind, that's a good thing. Also speaking about escalation, that is the reason why the U.S. doesn't provide us with long-range weapons and fighter aircraft. Don't you think that a lack of response to the Kremlin attack indicates also that Russia is simply bluffing on possible escalation? Well, I, I think the uh, Biden administration, when they talk about the war in Ukraine, they have two goals. One goal is to help Ukraine defeat the Russian military. Second goal is to avoid a direct military clash between NATO and Russia. Those are the right two goals. Although my criticism of the uh, Biden administration would be that it airs a little bit too side on caution. I don't think the Russians have done a good do job of articulating clear red lines. Uh, and I think, in fact, from what we've seen of Russian behavior, Russian actions over the past 15 months, uh, there is, in fact, room for the uh, West uh, to provide further weapons to Ukraine. Also, the Washington Post reports that 
Great Britain considers possible providing us with a long-range cruise missiles Storm Shadow. Could such a decision of British government push Biden administration to do the same? Well, the Storm Shadow is sometimes seen as an alternative to what's called the ATACMS. Both missiles have a range of about 300 kilometers. One of the reasons that the Pentagon has said that they are not uh, at this point providing Ukraine ATACMS is that they have a fairly low inventory. And, and this has been an issue for the U.S. military for the past 15 months, is while wanting to provide arms to Ukraine, they also have to keep certain minimum levels in U.S. war stocks. Now, the storm shadow, if the British do in fact provide that, would give the capability to the Ukrainians to strike targets up to 200 miles or 300 kilometers away, and that might in fact obviate some of the urgency of the need for the ATACMS. But do you believe that they are only technical um, possibility and uh, technical um, reasons why the U.S. doesn't provide us with uh, ATACMS missiles? Yeah, I, I think it may be a combination. It may it, with ATACMS. It may be a combination of one, uh, the technical reason, which is that there is a low stock in the U.S. inventory. But then it's also combined with, I think, again, some um, what I would call an overly cautious approach by the administration. Uh, I, I've been arguing that uh, we could have provided and should have provided ATACMS last fall, and. The issue, I think, that has concerned the, uh, the uh, White House has been these weapons being used to strike targets in Russia proper. And when I say Russia proper, I mean Russia defined in its 1991 border. Uh, but Ukraine has made very clear now for three or four months that it would not use Western-provided weapons to strike targets in Russia. They would only be used against targets in occupied Ukraine. Uh, so I think it's kind of a mixture of those concerns both technical and, and maybe overly uh, cautious approach by the, uh, by the administration. But don't you think that uh, Biden as an administration, administration is too cautious about it? Uh, don't you think that they are simply being bluffed by the Russian side? Well, I, you know, look, I, I, I give the Biden administration and their approach to this war fairly strong uh, grades. I mean, they've done a great job on the diplomacy, mobilizing a strong Western reaction. They provided tens of billions of dollars in support to the Ukrainian military. Um, again, I, I, I think they could do a bit more. Uh, and again, it's an understandable concern. They're trying to understand what might generate a massive overreaction by the Kremlin Again, I believe that as they make that judgment, they've been a bit on the too cautious side, but they are balancing things, and I think, in an understandable way. Also, I Ukrainian they officials... That balance a bit more, I, I wish they would be a bit more aggressive in how they came out with that balance. Also, Ukrainian officials say that um, some Western politicians uh, warn about uh, liberation of Crimea and say that liberation of Crimea could lead to a nuclear nuclear war. Why do they think so? Uh, I, I'm not sure about that. I, I think that um, Ukraine, uh, we're waiting to see the counteroffensive that Ukraine uh, obviously has in the, in the works. Uh, when that happens, I believe that Ukraine will uh, be able to liberate significantly more territory beyond what it liberated last September in Kharkiv and then again in November in Kherson. Uh, and I would like to see the Ukrainian military either be able to push the Russian military completely out of Ukraine or at least achieve such success on the battlefield that Moscow is prepared to negotiate a settlement that Ukraine could accept. But if Ukraine uh, doesn't want to have any negotiations with Russia, recently our foreign minister said that uh, Putin is not that type of the evil uh, with, with whom you, you should negotiate? Uh, well, let me say this. One, I think at some point there will be a negotiation between Kiev and Moscow. Uh, but two, now is not the time because, first of all, there is no indication whatsoever that the Kremlin would be serious in those negotiations. There's a complete disconnect between Russian demands and Russian performance on the battlefield. So, Remember back at the end of September, 
Putin announced the so-called annexation of Kherson, Zaporizhia, Luhansk, Donetsk, even though one, he didn't control all of those oblasts, and two, the Russian military had been losing on the battlefield for eight weeks. Until Moscow gets serious, there is no reason I see to get into a negotiation with the Russians. Quite frankly, I haven't seen any evidence that Washington is pressing uh, Ukraine to prematurely enter negotiations. But I do think at some point down the road, and it may be quite far down the road, there will be a negotiation. That depends first and foremost on a Russian decision to get a lot more serious about their negotiating terms, and then a Ukrainian decision to respond. Also, you mentioned Ukrainian counteroffensive operation. U.S. media reports that in case of unsuccessful Ukrainian counteroffensive operations, the international support of Ukraine could be weakened. In your opinion, does the support of Ukraine only depend on the upcoming counteroffensive operation? Yeah, I, I wouldn't quite overstate it in those bald terms, but I do think that it is easier both in the United States and Europe to sustain support for Ukraine when the publics and legislatures see Ukraine enjoying success on the battlefield. Well, that may become more difficult when there's a perception of a stalemate. Now, having said that, let me also make the observation that, say, 16 months ago, or in January or fe early February of 2022, had you asked me, would the West be stranding as strongly in support of Ukraine, providing financial assistance, providing tens of billions of dollars of military assistance, including things like main battle tanks, HIMARS missiles, uh, I would have been said that that, that would be a pleasant surprise. I, I think, in fact, the West has surprised itself. It certainly surprised the Kremlin, and maybe it's even surprised Ukraine with how the West has stood behind Ukraine. Again, I think that would be easier to sustain if there is a perception that Ukraine is winning on the battlefield. But could West also surprise us with a modern F-16 fighter aircraft? Um, also, um, Netherlands considers this question, but, but the U.S. still hesitates on it. Uh, you know, the F-16 debate right now reminds me uh, a bit of where we were when we were talking about main battle tanks, Leopards and Abrams tanks for Ukraine back in, say, October. Uh, I would not be surprised at all within six to ten months uh, there are F-16s going to Ukraine. So you believe that uh, in some moment of the future we, we could really rec receive F-16 jets? Yeah, again, I mean, it just seems to me that the debate that's now going on about providing Ukraine with F-16s is really a repetition of the debate that was taking place in the West last fall, say in October, November, about providing Ukraine Western main battle tanks. It took a while to go through that debate, but, you know, Ukraine now is, has received Leopard tanks, and I believe that uh, Ukraine has or will shortly begin training on American Abrams tanks. Let's move to the U.S. politics. Kevin McCarthy said that he would not give Ukraine a blank check. But, however, he changed his position and said that he would support Ukraine. What did cause a shift in his position? Uh, I'm not sure, but I certainly welcome that shift. Um, I mean, this has been one of the things, uh, I, I followed Ukraine, it's really 1993, and for almost, well, for 30 years now, Ukraine has largely been uh, a nonpartisan issue. Ukraine has had support both from Democrats and from Republicans alike. The first sign I saw of that bipartisan consensus of support for Ukraine, the first sign of danger was last year when, uh, when Mr. McCarthy and some other Republicans begin to question American support for Ukraine. So I do worry that there's a minority view within the Republican Party uh, that does not understand that, first of all, Ukraine is a victim, but also that the United States has key national interests involved in this and key interest in seeing that Ukraine prevails in this war. Uh, so I'm a bit more nervous than I would have been, say, a year ago, but I was glad to see that Mr. McCarthy seems to have changed his position, and I hope that that is reflected uh, the next time that there is a uh, bill in Congress uh, for support for Ukraine. 
And do you believe that such bipartisan support will continue even if we face a long war with Russia? Again, I, I think the war that it go, goes on, the longer it goes on, it will not be impossible, but it may require more effort by Western politicians to sustain support. I, for example, I would like to see the Biden administration on a fairly regular basis articulate what American interests are at stake, beginning with the United States for more than 70 years has defined a stable and secure Europe as a vital national interest. There are political reasons, economic reasons, and security reasons for that. However, if Russia wins this war, if Russia is winning, it's going to mean an unstable and insecure Europe. This matters to the United States. I'd like to see the Biden administration make that case a bit more clearly to the American public and probably repeat it. But I would also like to see the Republicans in Congress make that point, because right now the threat I see to American support in Congress, American support for Ukraine in Congress, comes not from Democrats, it comes from Republicans. I'd like to see some senior Republicans beginning to make the case that, yes, the United States has an interest in how this war turns out. Also, yes, President Joe Biden announced that he would run for a president. Um, how could uh, presidential elections in the U.S. influence the support of Ukraine? Yeah, well, let me say, first of all, the 2024 presidential election will be decided first and foremost by domestic issues, the economy and such like that. However, to the extent that foreign policy is a big issue, I would think there will be two issues. One will be China, the other will be the Russia-Ukraine conflict. And right now, the position that President Biden has, uh, I think, enjoys the support of the majority of American people. There have been a series of polls which show that Americans largely support uh, sending assistance to Ukraine. Uh, and uh, that uh, bodes well, of course, that, that lines up well with President Biden's position. Also, do you believe that President Biden um, has enough support to be re-elected re as a president? Yes. I mean, look, we're still, uh, what, a year and a half almost from our presidential election. A, a lot can change in time. Uh, but I think President Biden uh, has a good chance uh, of re-election, uh, particularly if his uh, opponent is Donald Trump. And it seems at this point that the Republican Party uh, right now uh, favors Donald Trump as their candidate. Also, recent news, a New York jury finds that former U.S. President Donald Trump sexually abused Ms. Kendall. In your opinion, how could this verdict influence a possibility for Mr. Trump to run for a president? Well, um, I, I spend most of my time thinking about uh, uh, foreign issues, not uh, domestic American politics, but I cannot see how this verdict is going to be helpful to Mr. Trump. It's going to hurt him. Uh, do, uh, could this verdict uh, reduce the support? For we'll Mr. have Trump? to see. Uh, again, I, I don't think this is, this is not a positive thing for Mr. Trump. So you believe that the electoral support from Trump could be reduced by this verdict? Well, again, we'll have to see how the polls show this, but I, I expect it's going to have a negative impact on his standing, yes. Also, there are lots of some uh, other cases uh, against uh, Mr. Trump. What do you, what do you think uh, about them and could they uh, really influence his possibility to run for a president? Well, I think, again, if there are additional indictments against Mr. Trump, again, that will, it's going to depend first and foremost how the Republican electric sees those. Uh, and, and my guess is that there is a significant part of the Republican Party, I can't tell you how large, that doesn't want to go through the drama and the chaos that they had uh, in the first Trump term and that they would see that these indictments, if they do come out, that's still got to be a decision made by prosecutors, uh, that they would simply mean that there would be that kind of drama and chaos. And my guess is a lot of members of the Republican Party would prefer not to see that. But again, uh, you know, I don't consider myself uh, an expert on the intricacies of American politics, uh, so I, it's hard to say how these things will play out. And again, bear in mind we're still... The election is not until November of 2024. There's a lot of time uh, between now and then. Also, in your opinion, will the Republican Party still choose Mr. Trump to represent them on the 
upcoming presidential elections, even after this verdict and uh, lots of uh, uh, cases in the courts? I don't know. All I can say right now is the polls show that Mr. Trump is ahead. We'll have to see uh, how this verdict and if there are additional charges filed against Mr. Trump, how they affect his standing. But again, it's a year and a half. A lot can happen in a year and a half in American politics. Also, my last question. Uh, Mr. Trump made some several statements on uh, Ukraine about uh, the negotiation, import, importance of negotiation with Russia. What is the reason of his position on the war in Ukraine? And uh, do Republicans really support such statements of Donald Trump's statements? Yeah, uh, I cannot pretend to understand what goes into Mr. Trump's pronouncements on uh, Russia and Ukraine. Uh, I, I, I do note that uh, when he was president, uh, he seemed to have a certain, um, well, he was reluctant to criticize Russia as president. He's been reluctant to criticize Russia since then. Uh, and of course, I think the only notable thing that happened in the only notable thing done by Mr. Trump in his four years as president with regards to Ukraine was his attempt uh, to uh, extort uh, the Ukrainian president to get involved in American politics. That led to Mr. Trump's first impeachment. Um, we'll have to see where the Republican Party is on these questions. I mean, polls do show, and this, for, quite frankly, is a surprise for me, because the Republican Party used to be the stronger party on national security issues. Right now, polls show that there's more Democratic support for the United States continuing to assist Ukraine than among Republicans. And this is where I think it's important that more of the mainstream Republicans, the Republicans who are closer to a traditional Republican view on national security, it would be good if they would begin to speak out uh, because their voices may carry more weight uh, than, uh, than that of, the, uh, of Democrats who are arguing for support for Ukraine. So that's why I say I'd like to see not only the administration be more clear about U.S. interests that are at stake in this war, but I'd also like to see in particular uh, senior Republicans uh, in Congress uh, speak out and explain to Republicans' constituency why there's a U.S. interest in seeing that Ukraine prevails in this war against Russia. Thank you, Ambassador Pfeiffer, for your time and for participation in the interview and uh, glory to Ukraine. The glory to the heroes.